today's passage is from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 10, verses 1 through 19. 2 Chronicles 10, 1 through 19. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he, went, he was in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned to Egypt, or he returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and all Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Come back to me in three days. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people? He asked. They replied, If you will be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders and gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, What is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, Lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, Tell the people who have said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our, light, our yoke lighter. Tell them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid a heavy yoke. I will make it heavier. My father's Scrounged you with whips, I will scrounge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam, as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered them harshly. Rejecting the advice of the elders, he followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy, I will make it heavier. My father scrounged you with whips, I will scrounge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from God to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ajayah the Shealite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, O David. So all the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam set out Adoniah, who was in charge of the forced labor. But the Israelites stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Let me begin today with another edition of Brian's Bad Jokes. I want to tell you a joke about making a mistake. A husband and wife decided to take a vacation down in Cancun, Mexico. They were both working, and it was hard to coordinate their schedules, so they decided the husband would go down first, and then his wife would follow the next day. The husband headed down to Cancun, got there no problem, got checked in, and thought he'd write a quick email to his wife. So he sat down, typed out the email, hit send. However, he did not realize that he had typed the wrong email address by mistake. A little while later, a widow was returning from her husband's funeral. She sat down to check her email, expecting messages from friends and family. Instead, what she saw was this. To my loving wife, from your departed husband. <laughs> Subject, I've arrived. <coughs> Honey, I have just arrived and checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. I hope your journey was, is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. It sure is hot down here. <laughs> that was a mistake. Today I want to talk about a mistake that hit even more damaging consequences. I've said several times that First and Second Chronicles are optimistic books. The writer wants to remind the Israelites of what they were like at their best and call them to live that way again. And this positive tone, this focus on the good, will kind of 
I mean, brushing over the bad parts of Israel's history is a constant theme in these books. However, even the most optimistic look at history is still going to have to deal with some of the darker moments in Israel's history. Today we're going to look at King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam was the son of Solomon who has gone down in history as the man who divided Israel in half. So I want to look at some mistakes Rehoboam made. Now, Rehoboam began his time as king under both a blessing and a curse. And both of these came in the form of promises from God. The blessing was a promise to Rehoboam's grandfather, David. God had promised David that his family would be king in Israel forever, that he would always have an heir to sit on the throne. And this was an unconditional promise that David's line would continue to reign in Israel. The curse was another promise given to King Solomon. Because of Solomon's sins, God promised that a portion of the kingdom would be taken away from Solomon's descendants. So Rehoboam began his time as king, knowing his family line would always rule in Israel, and knowing that eventually, either under his reign or one of his descendants, part of the kingdom would be torn away from them. And perhaps the pressure of this got to him, because Rehoboam made some pretty big mistakes pretty early on. And I want to look at four mistakes Rehoboam made. Rehoboam's first mistake was a Rehoboam went his way instead of God's way. The first thing we're told about Rehoboam is that he went to Shechem because all the people of Israel had gathered there to make him king. I'm like, okay, that seems all right, but <coughs> Rehoboam's choice of location was important. Rehoboam went to Shechem. That seem, might seem like a good choice. Shechem was a major city in northern Israel. It was the capital of the house of Joseph. And because of its proximity to some important trade routes, it was one of the richest cities in Israel at that time. So on the surface, it makes sense that Rehoboam would go to Shechem. However, the temple of the Lord was in Jerusalem. The last eight chapters of 1 Chronicles and the first seven chapters of 2 Chronicles are all about God instructing the people to build this temple. And God had come down, his presence had filled the temple. And God had said, this is my place. Now Rehoboam was going somewhere else. Rehoboam was presenting himself as the king for change. He was going to lead Israel into a new future, different from King Solomon and King David. He was leading people away from their history with the God of their fathers. I think that's something we still encounter in our world today. The idea of progress for progress sake. The idea of moving forward no matter where we're moving to. A phrase that's become popular over the last decade or so is to talk about being on the right side or the wrong side of history. As if the speaker can know the future and know where history is going to go. Rehoboam was moving forward, but he was moving away from the Lord. And if you've ever been in that situation, I think most of us had at one time in our lives, of saying, of, of excusing sin by saying, of just keeping up with the times, just moving forward. There are times that God is calling us back. He's calling us back to justice, back to honesty, back to the things that we have known are right since we are ch were children, despite all the ways we had excused what we knew was wrong. Sometimes God is calling us backwards, back away from the cliff, back to what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord. Rehoboam was moving forward, but he wasn't moving with God. He was moving away from God. He was going his way and not God's way. And that first mistake set Rehoboam on a bad path. Because it leads right to his second mistake. Rehoboam ignored wisdom. Solomon, for all his wisdom, had caused some problems in Israel. He had set the stage for rebellion. Solomon had done great things in Israel, but he had been very hard on the people. He had levied heavy taxes against the people. 
He had conscripted soldiers into his army. He had forced the people into hard labor to build his palace and his monuments. And after a generation of these conditions, the people went to Rehoboam. And they said, your father put a heavy yoke on us. If you will make it lighter, we will serve you. Well, this put Rehoboam in an interesting situation. If he said yes to the people, he probably would not accomplish as much as his father did. He wouldn't be able to do all the great things Solomon did. And in a sense, he would spend his entire life living in his father's shadow. On the other hand, if he said yes to the people, then he would make his people happy and he would stabilize the nation. So Rehoboam went to the elders who had served his father when Solomon was king. I said, what should I do in this circumstance? And the elders said, listen to the people. Make their load lighter, and they will be loyal to you for life. And Rehoboam rejected that wisdom. He turned away from wisdom. I don't want to be too harsh on Rehoboam here. I'm sure you've all heard the old saying, hindsight's 20-20. That is, it's easy to see wisdom after the fact. And I think sometimes we have those situations where we just didn't take good advice. And we face the consequences of that. And that's not really ignoring wisdom, it's just making a mistake. However, I think Rehoboam did more than just make a mistake. He chose to ignore wisdom. Notice that when Rehoboam was faced with his choice, he went to the elders first. He went to the people who he knew were going to give him good advice. He just didn't like what they said. He wanted people who would tell him what he wanted to hear. So Rehoboam ignored wisdom. He turned away from it. It makes me think of what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy. To suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Rehoboam ignored wisdom. He went after someone who would tell him what he wanted to hear. I think that's something we still struggle with today. Imagine you went to a doctor, and the doctor said, you have a seriously clogged heart, you will need surgery, and six to eight months of recovery afterwards. You want a second opinion, you go to a second doctor, and the doctor said, you have a seriously clogged heart, I'm going to brush your chest off with my hand to get rid of all the bad stuff, and you can walk out of here feeling just fine. That second one sounds a lot better. But no sane person would think that brushing off your chest is going to heal a vital organ inside your body. You think sometimes we take that attitude in life. We look for the quick fix. We look for what we want to hear. We look for somebody to tell us that's going to fix it overnight. We want five easy steps to a better life. And they're very easy steps, too. None of this complicated stuff. We want a single prayer or a single ceremony or a grand gesture that's just going to fix everything all at once. What our God offers is wisdom. What our God offers is a new life. It's not the easy way. As the author Terry Pratchett once said, the difference between the easy way and the hard way is that the hard way works. Our God offers a harder way. He does not offer the half measures of this world, but he offers a way that works. He offers wisdom. He offers a changed life. But we can't ignore wisdom. We can't go after just what we want to hear if we want a genuinely changed life. We have to seek the wisdom of the God who made us. Well, Rehoboam ignored wisdom. And ignoring wisdom then led to his next big mistake. Rehoboam's third mistake was that he had false friends. When he rejected the wisdom of the elders, Rehoboam went to the young men he had grown up with. He went to his friends. And his friends were right there to tell him what he wanted to hear. His friend said, if you want to get out from your father's shadow, you need to do more than your father did. You know, if your father put a, a heavy yoke on the people, put a heavier one. If your father whipped the people with whips, you whip them with scorpions. Not sure what that means, but it's a terrifying image. And that's what 
Rehoboam went with. He went with this idea of a heavier yoke. And I think, and I said that these friends were false friends. I think a lot of people in this world would say they were good friends. They supported Rehoboam. They encouraged him. They told him what they wanted to hear. That's not a true friend. A true friend is someone who tells us the truth whether we want to hear it or not. I think one of the struggles of our world today is that we struggle with the idea of friendship. We live in a world that calls acquaintances friends. We live in a world that wants these so-called friends to only tell us what we want to hear. But that's not true friendship. True, a true friend is someone who will tell us the truth, whether we want to hear it or not. Now, I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about calling somebody out in public. I mean that a genuine friend is someone who lovingly and kindly tells us the truth even when it's a truth we don't want to hear. Yep. However, Rehoboam had false friends. And all these mistakes compounded into his last and biggest mistake. Rehoboam <coughs> lacked compassion. Compassion means that when I see someone in need, I try to help them. If I see someone has a physical need, I try to meet that need. If I see someone is, is sorrowful, I try to comfort them. If I see someone is struggling in life, I try to be the one to help that person. Rehoboam lacked compassion. He listened to his false friends. And when the people came back to him, he said to them, My father put a heavy yoke on you, I will make it heavier. And when the people saw Rehoboam's lack of compassion, they rebelled against Rehoboam. There was a civil war, and the nation was permanently split in half. This was a disastrous result, and it could have been avoided. Now, Rehoboam's mistakes compounded on each other. He started by going away from God, and that led him to reject wisdom. And that caused him to listen to false friends, and all of that compounded into his biggest mistake. He lacked compassion. If Rehoboam had had compassion on his people... A war could have been averted. Now, in our lives today, it's unlikely that our compassion is going to have that dramatic of an effect. It's certainly not unheard of. The end of slavery, the end of segregation, beginning of programs like food stamps and child label laws, <coughs> all started, if you trace it back to one person having compassion on someone else. But even if our compassion doesn't change the world, Compassion changes lives. When we see someone is hungry and we make sure they have food, when we see someone is in the hospital or has lost a loved and we go to comfort them, when we see someone is struggling and we seek to help, when we see somebody is confused and we offer guidance, when we see someone broken down on the side of the road and we stop to see if they're okay, if we offer someone a ride to church, when we show compassion, it changes lives. It changes the life of the person who receives the compassion, and it changes our lives. Compassion changes lives. And one last thing to say about compassion to finish out today's sermon. Compassion has nothing to do with what the other person deserves. I said that compassion means that I see someone in need and I try to help them. It does not mean asking if that person deserves help. It does not mean that that person would help me if our circumstances were reversed. It just means that I see someone who needs help, and so I offer them compassion. Compassion isn't about what that person deserves. It's about me showing that compassion just because they need it. After all, that's how our God has treated us. He has shown us Compassion. God saw us in our helpless state. He saw us mired down by sin, unable to save ourselves. And he showed us compassion. He has offered us salvation. He has sent his son to die for us, to take away our sin, to offer us eternal life with him. And we did not deserve that. We have done nothing to earn it. 
That's the point. That is God's compassion to us. Not because we deserve it, but because He is compassionate. And now that He has shown us compassion, He calls us to show compassion to others. In a moment, we're going to stand for invitation. And as we stand to sing, if your life is lacking compassion, if you have not shown the love to others that God has shown to you and you want to see a change, if you want to start a relationship with God, if you need His compassion right now, or if you want to recommit yourself to Him, to His compassion, you have an opportunity. Or this week, talk to myself, talk to one of the elders. If you need compassion or if you need to start showing compassion, you have an opportunity. As you'll stand with me now for invitation hymn, which is the Savior is waiting, number 329, and we'll sing both verses.